good evening good evening saints god believers um everyone who's watching believer and unbeliever alike good evening good evening good evening to you i trust that the lord has increased you all who call on his name this week i trust that he is in Increase your knowledge of him and your understanding of him and his gospel. That he has kept you in perfect peace. That he kept your mind stayed on him. That he's continually building you up in this most holy faith. Moving you from faith to faith and glory to glory. For he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And we trust in him. The one true living God. The triune God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Man and amen. Um, we're going to start and uh, uh, we're going to um, we're going to go through a lot of Bible verses today. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things. As you see the title, right, we're going to talk about suffering. We're going to talk about it because it's needful that we talk about it. Right, and it's needful that we talk about it because, in uh, mainstream Christianity, in the modern day church that you see on television, with all the popular pastors and things like that, is it's either not spoken of at all, or lightly brushed over as just you know an inconvenience in this life, and that it's. Um, not really the will of God for you, right? Um, but uh, we're going to go through the promise of suffering because it's promised to us that we shall suffer, and suffering is needful for us. It's necessary. It's a necessary thing that God He uh, allows us and puts us and causes us to go through. It's for our good, <clears throat> and so that's what we're going to talk about day amen and so um i am going to start in just a second i thank god even for all of you who are watching live and who will watch after i thank god for you and praise god for you i um i reminded that um usually at this time if we were in the church service in the church the first 30 minutes will be dedicated to prayer um, and so I don't want to shirk that I want to remind you all to pray even if it's after the Bible study um, that 30 minutes of prayer is very good especially um, in the middle of the week as we do it um, corporate prayer 30 minutes of prayer is just an awesome thing to do and, you sh and as the scripture says men are to always pray amen all right, so we're about to start. <clears throat> um, we are going to start in John. Amen. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Uh, we're going to start at verse 31. We're going to start at verse 31. It says, Jesus answered them. Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen, amen, everybody. Sister Lindsay, Mike, babe, hola, hello, hello. God bless you. God bless you, Auntie. God bless you. Um, so that was John 16. And the next opening scripture we're going to turn to uh, will be uh, Philippians. Let's go to Philippians. Go 
go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 through 29. All right, Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to 29. I'm going to read it. And it says, But I would that ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are more are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ in of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am sent for the defiance of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, I will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall magnify, be magnified in my body, whether it be by my life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I will not. For I am in a straight betwixt the two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh, it's much more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, and whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you is given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which ye had in me, and now here be me be in me. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing to read his word. Amen. Good evening, Brother Reggie. How you doing? All right. So, as this title again, as the title says, uh, the promise of suffering. Right. Um, it, it it was needful to talk about this. Right. Because, as I said earlier. Uh, the modern church, the day's church, uh, suffering is not talked about. And if it is, it's just, a, it's just an a inconvenience, a minor inconvenience on your path to greatness, a minor inconvenience on your path to your dreams and goals. Just a minor inconvenience that's not really the will of God, right? It's really the will of the devil. God doesn't want you to suffer. Only the devil does. And so we have this teaching of suffering that is not according to scripture and that is not bring about the full counsel of God, which should bring about the peace of God, right? Um, and <clears throat> this, this, this came to me because I've been asked many, many times, and uh, whether you've been asked this question or not, you probably will or have been, been asked this question. It's a popular question uh, that is asked of Christians, whether to try to defraud them or to try to put them in a bind or to try to get them to say what the other person wants them to say according to this question that's about to be asked, which is, uh, can a homosexual be a Christian? I've been asked that question many times, and I'm sure maybe some of you have. You know, it's been asked a lot, especially in today's time with the LGBTQ and, you know, you got homosexual pastors now, and all these things, right? And so it's like, can a homosexual be a Christian? And, uh, it's a question that's often asked, and the answer can come in many forms, 
I've heard many different answers to this question. But a, the simple answer of truth, the simple answer is yes. That's the simple answer. It's the simple answer without getting into the complexities of it. Just yes. Right? That's the simple answer. But I believe the question and the response to the questions have been misleading and mishandled because of the false perception of suffering taught in the modern church. There's a false perception of suffering. Suffering is, again, just something minor that we come across. And usually suffering only has to do with, you know, poverty and sickness, right? That's usually what suffering has to do with, right? Um, but see, as, as, as human beings, as, as man, we have a natural version to uh, suffering. Nobody likes to suffer. You know, I'm sure you would agree with that statement. Nobody likes to suffer. Nobody likes to go through turmoil and anguish. No one likes it, whether it be physical or mental. You know, uh, just uh, recently, not too long ago, I had the worst mouth pain. And mouth pain, they say, is some of the worst pain you can go through. I mean, it was, and I agree, because that pain almost brought me to my knees. It was horrible. Horrible, horrible pain that I was going through, right? And I would have almost done anything to get rid of the pain. Knock my own tooth out of my head, take a take a hammer to the side of my face. It, I, it, I was getting desperate. I was so desperate, right? I, it started hurting me real bad in, at work. Um, I couldn't work. I just was standing there trying to, you know, tough out the pain. You know, and one of my uh, co-workers looked over at me. and was like, you all right, Jeff? And I looked up I looked up at him, you know, after stumping on the ground a few times, right? I looked up at him, and my eyes were filled with tears. They didn't fall, not yet. But, man, I was just, my eyes were filled with tears, and I had a look on my face like, oh, my goodness. And he was like, oh, man, you must be hurting. I'm like, man, you have no idea, you know. And then my boss came up and he was like, you know, go home. And so immediately I made my way home. And on my way home, I contacted my wife. Right. And I said, make me an emergency dentist appointment right now. I'm going to get this tooth pulled out my head immediately. I don't care what I look like. I can have no teeth in my mouth. Get this thing out. Because it felt like it was several teeth. It was just one. It was a wisdom tooth, but I didn't know at the time. It felt like it was like a couple in, over here on the side. I was like, man, we're going to yank all these bad boys out today. I got to the dentist. They was trying to ask me questions, right, about what the pain level and all this other stuff. I'm like, no, I just had to stop. I'm like, please, before you ask me anything, numb my mouth up. Hey, Mother Collins, how you doing? Numb my mouth, please, right? And so they did and so on and so forth. And they... uh let me know it was a wisdom tooth. They gave me some antibiotics and medication, things like that. But the point is to get out of that suffering, right? To get out of that physical suffering, I was almost ready to do anything. It was it was terrible. I was like, uh. And so it's the same with us all. We don't like to suffer, and even mental suffering. We will have to find a way to uh, get out of the mental suffering, whether it be to cut people off out of our lives you know we thinking they're the cause of our mental suffering right so we cut people out of our lives we're willing to you know uh destroy relations relationships or get rid of relationships we're willing to uh do drugs or any type of something that would take the mental anguish away we're willing to do anything also for mental suffering right even uh uh, go to false teachers, right? To hear what they got to say, right? Um, because since we don't, because we don't like to suffer, and the opposite of suffering is comfort. What we want is comfort. We want to be comfortable. Always, we're always seeking to be comfortable, not just comfortable, more comfortable, right? We're never satisfied with the comfort level. We're always trying to be even more comfortable. Right. I mean, when people when we try to get rich, right, we want to get rich because we want to live a more comfortable life. 
right? We want to make more money because we want to live a more comfortable life. We want a bigger house or a better car because we want to be more comfortable in the car, make, you know, that it won't break down, right? More confident it won't break down if it's a newer car, a better car, a more expensive car. You know, we want a bigger house or we want uh, insurances or things like that because we like comfort, we hate suffering and we like comfort and we're willing to do anything to try to be more comfortable, right? That's why people, you know, to get out of the suffering of poverty, right? You have people selling drugs, murdering, stealing, and killing because they want to get out of the suffering of poverty to set themselves up to be more comfortable, right? And so um, comfort is, is a dangerous tool, right? It's a dangerous thing to desire. Not saying, and I'm not rebuking or going against, you know, people being comfortable. If the Lord makes you comfortable, then be comfortable. But your comfort should be in the Lord. But we're going to get to that. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Amen. Um, bringing it back. The reason why false teachers and false gospels are so appealing, right? Because they bring a certain level of comfort. And that comfort could come in many different ways, right? You got the prosperity gospel that promises that God is going to bless you with your with your dreams and your goals, right? And with, with riches. You got the word of faith gospel where you can speak your reality into existence. And that, of course, you're going to try to speak a comfortable reality, right? You're going to speak your reality into existence. You got even a law-abiding gospel where they try to heap the law on you because you want to feel comfortable with, you only feel comfortable restrained. And wrapped up to you know because you want you know make sure that you trying to live holy or want to be holy and you know you you don't see the holiness on the inside of you right you don't see the holiness around you don't see you acting holy right so you need a law to tell you to be holy and try to make you holy even though you're still not keeping that law you like the comfort of it being there that you can look to and say and make yourself feel better because you keep a few of them i keep a few of these i don't i haven't murdered anybody right i haven't stolen anything so you think, right? I haven't blasphemed the Lord, so you think, right? So you 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 take comfort in having that law there because you can pick out the things that you do well and it makes you feel comfortable in your righteousness and it makes you feel comfortable when you see yourself, compare yourself to another person, right? Who is in sin or that you deem as in sin because to you, you're not in sin, right? That person is in sin. And so they look like that and at least I'm not that, Right. Because that makes you comfortable too, so you can be more comfortable where you are. You look at somebody else and compare them by yourself. And the scripture says when we do that, we're unwise. But again, you want to be comfortable. Right. And it's interesting about this comfort that's preached in these false gospels. Right. The 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 God that's preached in this false God in these false gospel is just uh, a God who's just all comfort, even though God is all comfort and he gives all comfort. It's a different type of comfort. But from the prosperity, word of faith type gospels and things like that, God doesn't want suffering. Only the devil wants suffering. So it's God contending with the devil, but it's God not really contending with the devil because God needs help in this gospel, right? In that gospel, God needs help. He can't contend on his own. He needs your buy-in. He needs you to buy in to the comfort and success and things he wants to give you. Because if you don't buy in, then the devil can continue to bar, 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 bombard you with suffering. And God don't want you to suffer. But as we read in the opening scripture, Paul clearly tells us in Philippians that um, it is given unto us on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for his name's sake. Right? So it's not only to believe, but also suffer. We are to suffer. We are to suffer for the name of Christ. Um, we're to suffer in many, many different ways. A lot of times, uh, like because of the modern day Christianity and the popular Christianity, the prosperity gospel, and this, that, and the other, like I said before, suffering is only thought of as sickness and poverty. Right? But there's another type of suffering that we endure. It's the suffering of sin and striving against sin. Hey, uh, Sister Norma, how are you doing? It's the suffering of sin, 
and striving against sin. It's a suffering um, that is not really talked about today. It's not really even uh, because not because it's it's um, how would I say it's it doesn't make money. How about that? It doesn't make enough money to talk about that type of suffering. Right. Because in those gospels, you're really a good person. Right. You're really a good person. You make mistakes, but deep down, you're really a good person. That's really a quote from Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen says that people just make little mistakes here and there. But deep down on the inside, they're really good people. But you see the difference between that statement and the truth of God, which is man is wicked and there's none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understand no one who seeks after God. All have turned their way. They all together become worthless. Right. You see this difference in that where God says that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That the leper can't change his spot, neither can the Ethiopian change his skin, neither can you do good, for you are always and are accustomed to doing evil. Where God looked over all the inhabitants of the earth, where, where his, and he saw that uh, the imaginations of man was evil from his youth, and his thoughts are evil continually. You see how there's a big difference between what the Bible teaches and what prosperity gospel, modern gospel, word of faith gospel really teaches. And because of that, we have people who don't think that suffering is of God. And they don't think and they think that when they fall into sin, right, that they have, they have two reactions to it. Right. They fall into sin and they, they're, they're doing their sin and they're OK with their sin, as in this is what this is OK. You know, I can just continue to do this or do that. And have no uh, remorse for it because the Lord hasn't given them the remorse, right? Because they use the grace of God for lasciviousness, as in Jude says, right? Because the Lord ain't given the spirit where they can uh, distinguish between good and evil, right? He hasn't given it to them, his knowledge and his spirit, by his spirit. He hasn't done it. And so when they hear these false gospels, it even propels them even forward even more, to do the wrong thing or the second aversion what the second thing they do right is when they fall into sin is that they condemn themselves they 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 fall into a condemnation of themselves where they 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 think they lost their salvation right and so every time they have to gain their salvation again they have to crucify Christ again. They have to get every time they fall. They have to gain again salvation because they're not uh, 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 holy enough. Their faith is not in the righteousness of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Their faith is in their own righteousness. Right to them, Jesus has provided a way for them to be to be righteous by their own works. But they got to maintain that righteousness through their works. So those are the two things you get from these modern day gospels that's not really the gospel at all as Paul would put it right and so what we're going to do now I want you, you know to get more of this understanding of suffering and the necessity of suffering and the promise of suffering because it is a promise to suffer and it is a necessity for the Christian life to suffer it's a necessity as we just read and so we're going to go to um, 2nd Timothy 2nd Timothy uh uh, chapter four. I will turn. I got. I got it two places. I got it in my Bible, of course, and I got it on my tablet. So I'm gonna read it from my tablet. But I want y'all to turn to your Bibles. All right. Um, Second Timothy, chapter four, verses uh, one through three. It says, "I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine." For time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap upon themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. Right? And so this is what happens, like I was just talking about. They, they turned unto fables. They turned unto things that uh, just tickled their ears. They, t they turned to a false gospel. 
but the true gospel is suffering, as it says in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 17 through 23. Galatians 5, 17 through 23. Oops, I didn't hit the camera. Sorry, y'all. It says, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17 through 23, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variants, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, ravings, and such the like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such things there is no law. See, the gospel is about suffering. It's about suffering. The suffering of Christ, right, is what gives, is the power of the gospel. Christ suffered for our sakes when we were yet God's enemies, right? Christ died for the ungodly while we are still his enemies. He suffered on our behalf the wrath of God so we wouldn't have to suffer the wrath of God. Right? Jesus tells us that in this world we will have tribulations. We're appointed to suffer by, as Paul's word says in Philippians earlier, we're appointed to suffering. Because we, we were appointed to believe, that means we're given the faith to believe, and now we're also given suffering along with that. Jesus says that to follow after him, right, you must take up your cross and follow him. The cross symbolizes suffering. And so we suffer. And the suffering that we mainly deal with, right, it's, it's, it's a very rare, especially in the West nowadays, to suffer persecution. It was really, it wasn't rare back in these times, the first century and things like that. It wasn't rare then, no. It was common, very common to suffer persecution in those times when uh, God was first building up the church, right? Very, very common for a, a hundred, couple hundred years it was common until the first Christian emperor came around, which was Constantine. All right? He was the first Christian emperor. So when the, once the emperor became a Christian, Christianity became a more uh, welcomed faith. And, you know, uh, more people started to convert. Right? Whether false conversions are true, it doesn't matter. More people start to convert because we're not here to talk about that, really. But before then, uh, persecution was... A major part of suffering for Christians today right today suffering over here in the West is not really persecution you don't really receive persecution like that now if you was in the east side of the world the eastern hemisphere then yes there's still lots of persecution going on over there you have people our brothers and sisters in Christ suffering for the name of Christ uh, even unto death right but a common suffering that every Christian goes through that they can't get out of that's going to come that comes with the title and the spirit of God on the inside of you is the suffering you suffer with sin and the suffering you suffer against sin. As we read that the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh lusts against the spirit. So you're not able to do what it is that you want to do. Right. That's a suffering that that's a, that's a, a war going on the inside of you. And it's a suffering. I mean, if you ever really strived, strived against sin, right? Because it's really not, I do this because it's really not you striving. It's the Lord on the inside of you. But if you ever have done that, right? If the Lord ever worked that in you where uh, a fleshly desire came up, the Lord caused it. He hands you over to your flesh for a second where you desired something heavenly and you was trying to do it. But then he restrained you by the spirit where he kept you, and so you you want to do it, but you're, he's holding you back, and you're like, ah, you know, that's a suffering. And you feel great at the end of it because he kept you from it, and then the, 
the lust or whatever you're feeling passes, right? But in the moment, you're suffering, right? This is a symbolism of, you know, this is why um, fasting is a symbolism of this type of suffering, right? You fast, you slowly killing your flesh, depriving it of its nutrients, right? Because the idea is to be able to uh, buffet your body, as Paul says, right? That's the idea, right? To be able to, so that when you come against sin, or you're coming against it, and uh, it's, it's, it's working its way, you know, you're being tempted of your own flesh to do those things which are not, are unseemly, right? It's supposed to help. But regardless of how much you fast, if the Spirit of God ain't on the inside of you, He doesn't do the restraining, you won't be restrained. Right? Because you have monks who aren't Christian, Buddhist monks who fast to try to restrain themselves from worldly desires. Right? Yet they're still not without sin. Right? So the fasting is just a symbolism of that. And it's good to do led by the Holy Spirit, of course. But let's again, <clears throat> um, it's the Spirit of God that keeps us. And so, you know, we're, we're called to suffer. And then while we're called to suffer, we're called to have joy in the suffering. So we're called to suffer and we're called to have joy in the suffering. If we go to uh, 2 Timothy, right, uh, verse 3 uh, Paul tells Timothy, he says, therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So he's telling us, you know, endure hardness, endure suffering, endure the things that come with the Christian walk as a good soldier. Right. You, you, you endure it and you take it as a good soldier. And then he goes on to say, let me turn to this, actually, the whole scripture. I only got part of it down in my notes. Right. Um. But what he says is, uh, in verse 4 of that same thing, he says, No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him which have chosen him to be a soldier. All right? So, he's given an example of, you know, not taking in the account of the things going on the outside, right? But your mind and heart and your soul and your eyes are looking unto Jesus. Always looking unto Jesus. In the midst of your suffering, looking unto Jesus. That's the only way you can endure the hardness. If God sets it, if God has your eyes set on him, right? If you have your eyes set on him, you're able to endure the suffering. Because you understand a few things. You understand that, first of all, the suffering comes by way of him in whom you look to. It comes by way of him. He's the one that brought it to you. Whether he's whether he's handing you over to your flesh, whether he's um, um, bringing others your way, right? As Paul says, a, a thorn was given to him, a messenger of Satan to buffet him, right? And he asked the Lord three times to have it removed. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My power is made perfect in weakness, right? And so it's the same with us. A thorn may be in our flesh. It could be a person. It could be a, a lust. It could be a sickness. Whatever, right? It could be all that, right? But it's 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 for our good. But suffering again is needful. Hey, Amber, how you doing? But suffering is needful, right? Uh, again, also in James, in James chapter one verse two, it says, "My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in into divers temptations, knowing this." That the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, so that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The patience, patience to wait on the Lord, patience to trust in him that in due time he will release you from whatever it is you're suffering with. And an account of sin to release you from that sin, to remove the taste of it from your mouth. All right. And so when the question's asked of me, right, can a homosexual be a Christian? And I told you, of course, the simple answer is yes. But many people, they don't understand that. They won't accept that answer or they'll be confused by it because they don't understand what suffering is. Right. So so some people have gone the way of saying, yes, 
they can be a Christian and it's okay as they live, to continue to live their lifestyle, right? To continue to go ahead and do this, that, and the other. That's like saying, yes, a drug addict can be a drug addict. He can still be a Christian, yes. And he, you know, as long as he continues to do his drugs and, you know, murder people or whoever, anybody in any type of sin to say, yes, as long as they continue in it, and they can continue in it further and further. And if they continue in it with no remorse, with no struggle against the flesh and the spirit, it shows that the spirit is not on the inside. But again, that's not for, that's for them to see what God is working in them. Right? Because you don't know what God is working in anybody. Maybe not even yourself, if you can't see. Right? If the Lord didn't give you eyes to see, then you can't see even what's working in yourself. Right? But some God has set up that they continue with no remorse. And it's his purposes for what they continue. Right? But there are some, right? Homosexual. Uh, fornicator, adulterer, klepto or thief, a coveter, a blasphemer, idolater, right? Who struggles in their sin, who who has that spirit war against the flesh and with the spirit, uh, flesh war against the spirit, where they have desires that sometimes are given over to, and sometimes the Lord restrains, and it's an ongoing battle. But in any type of suffering you're enduring, the hope is the hope is to wait on the Lord's patience. As uh, James says here, patience, let patience have its perfect work. And the patience is the patience of waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord to remove it from you. And he may remove it from you as, again, taking the taste from your mouth or maybe removed from you through death. However, he removes it from you. Your hope and your focus should always be on him, not on your sin, not on your condition. Right. Your sin condition. Your hope should always and eternally be looking unto him, the author and the finisher of your faith, looking unto the hills with cometh your help for all of your help cometh from the Lord. And so in this. In, the, in that suffering, right, we, we become imitators of Christ in this suffering, in all types of suffering that we endure, that the Holy Spirit causes us to endure, that God brings our way so that we can endure. You know, again, a Christian life is marked with suffering. There's a difference. The difference between a Christian and an unbeliever is not how much they sin. It's the relationship with sin. A Christian suffers when he sins. He suffers, right? Because, again, it's that ongoing war on the inside. An unbeliever doesn't suffer. They love it. They love their sin. They haven't been granted repentance. And as Bishop says, repentance is a change of mind to consider what they've been doing. They've been going the wrong way. They haven't been, they haven't been granted that. God hasn't given it to them. So they don't consider they're going the wrong way. But you, as a believer, you consider you're going the wrong way. You consider that what you're doing ain't isn't right. And that is by God. That is by God. So we're going to, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, we imitate, we imitate Christ in the suffering, right? Because Hebrews chapter 12, verses uh, 1 through 2, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also are compassed about with the great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And the sin which so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race set before us. Hold on before I get to where we're going to talk about that. Right there. He's saying he's saying what I just said in different in a different way. Right? He's saying we lay aside every way and the sin which so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race set before us. It's that patience. Just like what James said, patience have its perfect work. That patience in dealing with the sin. We lay aside the weight of sin. Who we lay, how we lay aside, we cast our cares upon him, Jesus Christ. We cast it upon him in the midst of our suffering, knowing that he loveth and careth for his own. Right? We cast it on him. We look to him, even in the midst of our suffering. Even when we're in the midst of doing it. 
right? Because uh, in all our ways, we acknowledge him. And he shall direct our path. It says in all your ways, not in just your good ways, not just when you think you're being righteous or holy, when you think you're doing good, you acknowledge him in all of your ways. See, when you're able to acknowledge him in all your ways, right, you're able to have peace and you're able to look to him and you're able to endure the suffering. Right? I'm not saying that you're not going to sin. No, I'm saying that when you're suffering and struggling against that sin and you're able to acknowledge him, it helps you press through and get through where well, you can look to Jesus. You know, you have you have a sure hope when you're able to do that. You have a sure hope where you're not thrown left or to the right by every wind of doctrine or thrown every time you fall. Right. Thinking that you lost the Holy Spirit, think that you lost some type of rapport with God that you done built up in your arrogance. You think you built up some type of rapport and now you lost it. Right. You, you don't deal in that foolishness. You deal, in, you deal in the truth of the matter is that Jesus Christ is your righteousness. And when you fall, there's no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. Right. So you're not you don't condemn yourself because there is no condemnation. Because. Christ is your righteousness and you keep looking to him and in due time, as you keep looking to him, he continues to move you from faith to faith and from glory to glory. And as he's doing that. He's removing different sins and different lusts that you may struggle with. As he continues to grow you. Right. But never in this life will you be perfect. You're never going to be sinless in this life. Never. You're always going to struggle with sin. But that's the suffering you're called to suffer with. You're called to suffer. Against sin. Because Christ suffered for you. So you're called to suffer. The great thing about your suffering is it doesn't end in condemnation. The great thing about your suffering is that it ends in your glorification. That's why Paul says it's not the suffering we suffer now is not worthy to be compared to the glory that we revealed in us. So the sufferings we suffer, they're going to they they we suffer them because in turn it's going to work out for our good. For all things. And as Pastor Lindsay would say, what's on the other side of all? Nothing. So in all things, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. Now, the called according to his purpose. Amen. Um, in verse three of the same chapter, in Hebrews 12, verse three. Right. It says, for consider him. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped verse two. I'm sorry. I just went through verse one. Verse two. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, 4. Consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. How is that for encouragement? Right? We're encouraged to know that we can look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who also suffered even as we suffer, he suffered because he took the wrath. He took on sin himself and endured the wrath of God on our behalf. So the scriptures tell us that, you know, we have such a great high priest that's not uh, uh, he, he understands our temptations for he was tempted. He was tempted in every temptation that we we're tempted with. Right. So he understands not to say that he was a sinner and that he sinned in his mind like we do. But this temptation that he received came from the outside. So people tried to tempt Jesus throughout his whole life. Of course, women, uh, drugs. If there was drugs back then, I'm pretty sure there was type, some type of drugs. Right. Greed. People trying to get him to be greedy. All temptations came to Jesus that come to you. The difference is they came from the outside where yours come from your own flesh. You're tempted of your own flesh. Right. And so um, it says, uh, oh, I just read that for it. Consider him who endured the contradiction of sinners himself. Least you be weary. So we consider him, at least we get weary in striving against sin. And the striving I'm talking about is the, the, the Lord doing the striving inside of you. Right. Because you wouldn't 
do that in yourself. You wouldn't strive against sin. You never have. You won't do it. You, you never have strived against sin. You, you won't do it. It's uncomfortable. And as I told you already, we don't like being uncomfortable. We don't like suffering. Our whole lives revolve around being more comfortable. Right? So we don't like to be uncomfortable. We like comfort. And so, but what we should take comfort in, the, so, and like, so getting back to comfort real quick, because I mentioned it earlier, right? And so I'm come back to it, which is God is the God of all comfort, right? I said it earlier where, you know, prosperity gospels and false teachers try to make God a God of all comfort, where what I meant was that he's only wants you to be comfortable, right? He never wants you to suffer and suffering comes from the devil, right? But it's, that's even though that, that's not the truth, as we just saw and just uh, proved through scripture, right? That that's not the case, that we're called to suffer as Christians. And we're promised that we would suffer is a promise. The prom Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord is faithful to deliver them from them all, right? So we have a promise of suffering. And so... Uh, and but when we look at Christ, right, when we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, when we look to him, right, and we see the suffering that he suffered, why do we think that we won't suffer, right? A lot of times, even though we know here, it's not often preached why Christ suffered. Not just, and I'm not talking about the part where he suffered just for sinners, but like what was the cause? Who caused Christ's suffering? Right. Who caused it? We understand here that God was the cause. Right. In Isaiah 53, 10, it says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And he hath put him to grief. Right. So it pleased the Lord to do so. So we understand it was God's pleasure to have Christ suffer. And so Christ being the only begotten son of God. And it pleased God to have him suffer. We being adopted into the family through Christ. Think we're not going to suffer. Right. Again, in Acts 2, 23, it says him being Jesus being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. Have ye taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. See that there? The beautiful uh, uh, sovereignty of God mixed in with the will of man. Because man has a will. It's just wrapped up, right, in whichever uh, either sin or righteousness, whichever they're a slave to, whichever the Lord has handed them over to, right? If the Lord hands you over to sin, you're a slave to sin. If the Lord has hands you over to his righteousness, you're a slave to righteousness, as the Bible put it. You're a slave to one or the other. Right. And so by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. Right. Wicked people crucified Christ. They killed him, caused him to suffer. But it was at the hands and cause and foreknowledge of God. And so even us, when we suffer, is by the foreknowledge, plan, counsel, determined will of God. And it doesn't matter where the suffering comes from. So when that homosexual Right. Or when that fornicator or when that greedy person, that uh, gluttonous person, when that liar, thief, adulterer, whatever it is you're dealing with. Right. Can can they be Christian? Of course. And their life will be marked with suffering. Does it mean that God's going to release them from whatever they're dealing with? Homosexuality? Or this? No, they may deal with and struggle with that for the rest of their life it's not a bar it's not a disqualification of Christianity many people think so or many people teach it is in, in error right but it's not their life as your life as my life as every Christian life from Christ on right 
as every Christian life from Christ on is marked with a suffering where they strive against sin. Some God, by his mercy, removes the taste from their mouth. Where you have homosexuals, right, former homosexuals that don't, aren't homosexual anymore. You have former drug, ad drug addicts who aren't drug addicts anymore, right? You have former thieves who aren't thieves anymore. You have former, former fornicators who aren't fornicators anymore. You have former adulterers who are not adulterers anymore. You, you have those, right? They no longer participate in the act. And then you have those that still fall into the temptation every now and again. But their hope and their faith and trust is in Jesus Christ. For the, this is a trustworthy saying, as Paul says, the Lord knows those who are his. He knows. He knows those who are his. You don't know, I don't know. He knows. Right? Amen, Bishop. Sin is the absence of faith. Right? It's the absence of faith. Anything that is not of faith is sin. And that faith must be rooted in Jesus Christ. If you're not looking to him, if you're not uh, acknowledging him in all your ways, if you're not trusting in him, then you're in sin. If you're thinking that you can do it, that you got one, two, three steps to no more uh, homosexuality, you got one, two, three steps to no more drug addicts, it being no more a drug addict or alcoholic or whatever, and you're not looking to Jesus and thinking that your righteousness is enough to get you in, still feel sorry for you. See, the issue is um, when people, when the pastors or teachers, they don't teach about suffering or they teach it in errors thinking that God doesn't want you to suffer, they make the mistake, right? Of comparing God to themselves right they say well I wouldn't do that to my children I wouldn't strike my children with sickness I wouldn't uh, allow sickness to come upon my children I wouldn't allow disease or poverty to come upon my children I want my children to be blessed and wealthy and healthy and this that and the other right and they make God into a man right they make the mistake of thinking God is like them. And he's not. There is none like him, the scripture says. It says, I am God and there is none like me. He's not just talking about other gods because there is no other gods. He's talking about nothing in creation like him. There's none, nobody, nothing. What's on the other side of nothing? No thing, nothing. There's none. What's on the other side of none? Some? A little bit? A few? No. None. There's none like him. So when we compare ourselves, or we compare God to ourselves, right, and say, well, I wouldn't do that. Of course you wouldn't. You're not God. You don't know. See, Jesus put it this way. He says, uh, I believe he, uh, where is it? Um, uh, where is it? Where is it? He says in Luke uh, 11, 11 through 13, he says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? So if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Right. So Jesus put it that way. You are evil and you give what you call good gifts to your children. How much more will the Holy, uh, the Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? In Matthew it says good gifts and Lucas says Holy Spirit. One and the same. Right? It's one and the same thing. Good gifts and the Holy Spirit is one and the same thing. Because the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the good gifts. Because it comes with those spiritual gifts. It comes with all the spiritual gifts that we talked about earlier. Love, meekness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all that. Right? And so, um, but they compare themselves. They compare God to themselves and make him a man. And that's where they mis their mistake lies. Because God is not evil like you. 
Jesus just said, you are evil. And God is not evil like you. He's not. I know you want him to be. I want because you want him to make sense to you. You want him to make sense because, you know, you wouldn't do that. It doesn't make sense for somebody who loves you to cause you to suffer. It doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't he just take this sin from me? It doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't he just take that sin from that person? It doesn't make sense that they're still a drug addict. They can't be Christian. Right? It's contrary to what I believe and to what I believe the scriptures are saying. Because I can only see the letter. I don't see the, the belief in Christ. I just see what it says you shouldn't do. And then you're not considering yourself as the places where you fall. Oftentimes when I go through the list of the flesh, I tell you and I say, if you don't see yourselves in this list of sins throughout the New Testament and the list of desires and lust of the flesh, you're lying to yourself. All right? You're a liar. Because he covers all of us. Puts us all under the condemnation of sin so that God can have mercy on us all. All right. And so getting back to it. So these teachers, right, they 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 take that scripture and they, you know, they they forget that they are evil. And God is not like them. Right. And they'll take a scripture like Jeremiah 29, 11, famous, popular scripture. Right. And says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Right. And so we look at that and we're like, okay, God promises people peace and expect it. He, though he, he knows the thoughts he, he thinks towards us. So those thoughts must be my thoughts. Because I know what I want. And I know what I would do for my kids. I know what I would do for my loved ones. So his thoughts must be along the lines of my thoughts and what I would do. Uh, again, that's a, that's a no. Right? His thoughts are higher than your thoughts and his ways are higher than your ways you know it's, it's interesting that this promise to God's children of knowing the thoughts he thinks towards us right thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you to give us an expected end that's interesting because a lot of times when we think of that we think selfishly and only of our own right uh, uh, lives right or we only think of things going on here over the west are these promises not to our brothers and sisters on the east how about, how about, was these promises not to Paul, James? Let's see. What was Paul's end? Oh, uh, he had his head cut off. Right. Was these promises for Paul, though? Of course. But his expected end, right, was to have his head cut off. But the future of what he looks forward to is that kingdom of God. See, we, we spend so much time looking at the natural. We don't focus on the promise of God, which is spiritual. We look at the promise, like the scripture says, God is not ashamed to be called the God of those men of our the forefathers, right? Who did not look for the earthly kingdom, who did not look for the earthly promised land, but had a hope for that which was in heaven. Right? That's what he says in, in, in Hebrews, right? But so this promise is it, it was for people like Paul, right? It was for it was for Peter, who was crucified upside down, right? It, it was for James, who was thrown off the top of the temple, right? It, it was for John, who was boiled in oil, and then he didn't die immediately. So then, seeing how he didn't die, they they just exiled him to the island of Patmos, right? It was it was for Stephen, who got stoned to death, right? It was for, uh, um, what was the uh, the, the 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 I forget one of the apostles Timothy. It was for Timothy, right? Who went to India and got killed with spears. It, it, it was for the apostles. It was for the first century church, where many of them were uh, thrown into the Colosseum and fed to lions, or they were hung on light posts and burned at night to light dinner parties to you know to light the area. It was for them too, because the thoughts the Lord thinks towards us. And not our thoughts. Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his is the death of his saints, the scripture says. And so uh, how, 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 how do we think of these things and how do we end these things? Right. What, what, what is the what is the hope we look towards? Right. 
It's always Jesus. That's the hope. We always look towards Jesus. We always put our hope and trust in him. The scripture says in uh, Titus 11 through 15, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God, our great God, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, whom gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Speak these things and exhort and rebuke with all authority that no man despise thee. See right here. This is our hope. When we're struggling and against sin, right? If we have you know all these things, right? Teach us denying ungodliness and worldly lust to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. How do we do that, Paul? How do we live soberly, godly, and righteously in this present world? Looking for that blessed hope. Looking unto Jesus. Looking, looking into the hills, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's how we do it. God keeps our eyes focused on him. Not that we're going to live a perfect life again, but it's the faith that we have. The faith, you know, who gave himself for us. We're looking for that, the one who gave himself for us. Trusting in him who gave himself for us, that he might redeem for himself. He might, he might redeem us from all iniquity. So from all that sin we struggle with, he redeems us of it. That's why there's no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. right? He redeems us of it and he purifies unto himself. He purifies. Not you purify. He purifies. He does the work. You're a byproduct of the work that he, that he does. It is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And you're zealous for good works. Why are you zealous for good works? Because he, he's doing it. You're zealous for good works because he is doing it. He has to do it. Because you won't do it. You have no desire in your flesh to do it. And any desire you have to do, it comes from the Holy Spirit on the inside. And anything that you are doing, any fruits that you are bearing, is not bearing because you, you're bearing it because of the vine who nourishes you. He's the vine, you're just the branch. The vine nourishes the branch. If the branch doesn't receive nourishment from the vine, it will not produce fruit. It's simple. Christ put it in the parable. He's the vine. You're the branch. Any branch that's in him that does not produce fruit, it means that he's not in them. All of us are in him because in him we live, move, and have our being. So the believer and the unbeliever, everybody's in Christ because in him we all live, move, and have our being. But Christ is not in everybody. And as the vine decides who to feed, which branch to feed, so does Christ choose for himself the people whom he chooses according to his will he does it verse uh, chapter 3 of Titus same same book uh, chapter 3 verses 3 through 8 says for we ourselves were sometimes foolish disobedient deceived serving divers lust and pleasures living in malice and envy hateful and hating one another but after the kindness and love of God, our Savior, towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed abundantly, he shed on us abundantly through Christ Jesus, our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will will that you affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto man. 
It's God who does it. it, it it's God. He. He did it. Right? Because we ourselves, when left to ourselves in that darkness, right, well, that we were created in, just like the earth was in the beginning, just the, we were created in that darkness, and when left to that, as he says in verse 3, we ourselves were sometimes foolish, right? Disobedient, all these things of the flesh, right? But when the light appeared, when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, when that light appeared, when God said, let there be light in the earth and there was light and God separated the light from the darkness and God called forth the light in us and separated the light from the darkness in us, right? Not by works, which we have done. He's very clear on that. Not by works, but by his mercy, because God has mercy on whom he will have mercy and he has compassion on whom he will has compassion and whom he wills, he hardens. It's all him his doing he does it that we are justified by his grace and we are made heirs according to the eternal hope right and we're careful to maintain good works not because of us no but because of him and any desire we have to be careful to maintain comes from him any desire we have it all all comes from God and him alone. All right, I'm going to stop right there because I just looked at the time. I went over a little bit. It's 8.06. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there. Amen. Um, I, I pray that the, the word uh, enriched you on tonight. I'm going to pray us out. Um, and then uh, hopefully I'll see you all soon. Um, of course, Bishop will be preaching on Sunday. Oh, that's what I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here like I'm forgetting something. What is it? Like Pastor Lindsay would say, right? $20 is the minimum we used to try to give upon his uh, direction and command, right? $20 is the minimum in offering that we would try to give in Bible study, Sunday school, those two places, right? We haven't been doing Sunday school because we're not in the church, but we do Bible study, which is this. And so you can look on the uh, Facebook page, right? And it has ways that you can give. You can give through uh, Zelle or Cash App if the Lord places upon you to give. You know, again, the desire came upon me remembering Pastor Lindsay's words. Um, and so uh, if it comes upon you as well, feel free. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, God bless you all. Oh, let me pray this out. There we go. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We glorify you, Lord, and magnify you on today. We thank you, Lord, for this life and the things pertaining therein as you continue to move us from faith to faith and glory to glory. Lord, keep us in perpetual weakness. For when we are weak, we are strong. For your strength is made perfect in weakness. Your power is made perfect in weakness. Your will is made perfect in in weakness and so lord keep us in that perpetual weakness so that we may always be strong by looking unto you the author and finisher of our faith by looking to the hills with come with our help for all our help cometh from the lord we thank you father for all that you're doing we thank you holy spirit and we thank you lord jesus we glorify you magnify you amen 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 and amen love you all um good night <laughs>